All right, well then let's go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, Terry, do you mind <laughs> dive right in? And if, uh, if I could ask folks to mute themselves until we're in conversation, that would be great so that we can cut, uh, cut out distracting noise. So go ahead and mute, mute yourselves. Um, and then let's, let's go ahead and get started. I am, this is gonna be a, a cozy conversation since it's just a, a handful of us, which, uh, which is just fine. Um, okay, so please make sure, like I said, the sound is off and then please answer what does sustainability mean to you and where you're uh, chiming in from. Since we can't be together physically, it's kind of nice to know where people are. Um, I, Jerry, if you're still there, can, uh, can you go on to the next slide? Great, thank you. So I'm Mary Silwantz. I've been thinking about writing about and uh, working in sustainability in some form of another for, gosh, nearly 20 years. Um, and I first became interested in sustainability because I, nature is where I experienced the divine and uh, I got into sustainability to express my love for earth, just to put it very simply. Um, our time together tonight will provide some review of what was discussed in part one. And then, um, then of course, some new stuff to kind of, but I need to start with a little bit of background from part one to launch us into what we're gonna talk about. Um, we can go on to the next slide. So if we can go on to the next slide. So as you were trickling in, I asked you to do two things. Where are you from? And what does sustainability mean to you? And that I wanted to start with those questions because to reflect on a relationship with our earthly body means we ground ourselves in the particulars of our own earthly body, our particular here and now. So think, take, take a moment now to just think about where you are who is around you or what is around you? What is beyond your screen? What do you see, hear, smell, or touch? If you're sipping or nibbling on something, what is it? Which direction are you facing? And what's just outside from where you're sitting? So in other words, what's in your ecosystem? How are you showing up in your ecosystem? And how is your body feeling? I don't know if any of you were on screens all day for work or uh, where you're coming to, to this meeting from. No, something just happened to the screen. <laughs> Jerry, are you still screen sharing? There we go. <laughs> Okay, so I asked, how is your body feeling? And we're gonna keep coming back to this idea of checking in with our bodies throughout our time together, because that is critical to our conversation about sustainability. That picture, by the way, that you're seeing is purple dead nettle, which I absolutely love. It grows like crazy this time of year, and it is good for a bazillion and one things. Um, so that's why I put a picture there. In fact, if you are unfamiliar with purple dead nettle, I'm going to drop a link in the chat for you so that you can, you know, glory in it with me. Um, okay, so hopefully you all start geeking out about purple dead nettle like I like to. Okay, so now let's take a minute to talk about what sustainability means to you. How are we defining sustainability? Um, and I can share what people wrote in the chat. Uh, Jerry said, don't eat your seed corn, which is <laughs> a really funny way of putting it. It's pretty succinct. Harry said, sustainability is being able to continue for a significant time. 
And then Tom said, does what I do, does, does what I am doing serve the planet for a long time? Tim said, sustainability means to me a plan to, by nature and honoring it, create a system that preserves and enhances life. Yeah. And Joe says, living light on this earth, which honors the creator. Oh, and Tim told us how he was feeling in his body. I love that so much. I just finished two mint chocolate milkshakes. Yum. And feel less bad now after we're in front of a screen most of the day. Yeah. Oh, and Tom said, my windows are open. I could feel the breeze and hear the birds and singing. And he's happily tired from a good day's work. Beautiful. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, so this idea of sustainability, meaning um, to, on, to create systems that preserve and enhance life, living light on the earth to continue for a significant time and not eating our seed corn. I'm really intrigued. Thank you all for sharing in, in the chat there. Um, we can go on to the next slide. I'm really intrigued by this idea of sustainability. Will you go to the next slide? Um, but how are we? How do we define sustainability? Um, do we do we define it objectively, or are we? Do we define sustainability in comparison to what is unsustainable? Any thoughts on that? We can, um, you can unmute yourselves if you want to respond to that. Or you can drop the, a comment on the chat. Do we define? Uh, I I, I would make a comment if you can hear me. Yep, can. That, uh, sustainability existed long before humans were around to understand the concept. So it's like kind of a, a self-perpetuating cycle in feedback loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's another definition I'm giving. Oh, okay. Thank you for that. I'm thinking about the sustainability initiatives that we create now um, in the environmental movement. How are we defining those um, initiatives? Or how are we thinking of sustainability now, given that we are far removed from that sort of uh, beautiful definition that you just shared? I so, think we use both definitions. Say it again. I think we use both. Same. I think we use the thought process of, here we are, but also how are we unsustainable that we need to improve and become sustainable? Mm, okay, yeah. So I pose the question because I wonder if there's more available to us, if there's a greater range of things to want or range of expression beyond sustainable and unsustainable. That sort of creates a binary. And we're gonna get into this a little bit later, but this, if we judge everything as sustainable or unsustainable, those kind of binaries support systems of oppression. So let me give you an example. Purple dead nettle is considered a weed, something to eradicate, something to get rid of. It's considered bad within the binary of people, you know, wanting grass to grow or things that we value as plants. Rather than thinking about all the nutritive and medicinal, never mind the eco um, ecosystem services that it provides. So I guess I want us to think about expanding how we think about sustainability. What do we want? Like, what is our dream for the world? What is it we dream for ourselves? And what do we dream of in our relationship with Earth? I, I think we also wanted a connectiveness uh, to sustainability, that it is not a one dimensional, one uh, picture piece. 
mm. but it involves related things that then change the picture. Like, say, there are nine different things from attitude uh, to, say, machine learning to, say, uh, uh, permaculture mm. to, say, politics uh, to, say, uh, religious revival. Uh, that each of these uh, affects the other. Mm. So what we want is a geometric sustainability where one feature of, of our life experience can hook up with other, other pieces and other, and other people to, to, uh, to give us a, a real fulcrum to do what we need to do. Mm. Yeah, that's really well said. And we are definitely going to explore that even more. You must have jumped ahead a little bit because, yeah, I'm definitely going to get to that, Harry. Thank you for expressing that so eloquently. Um, will you go to the next slide, please, Jerry? Oh, actually, we're going to stop screen sharing for a minute. Um, so, yeah, will you stop screen sharing? Thank you. So one of the things that we're gonna do now is take a moment to think about systems that support our life um, and how they fit into this bigger context of sustainability. So in the chat, um, if you could drop numbers one through 10, like make yourself a list of one to 10, I can model what I mean here. Um, so I'll do like one. Oops, that didn't work. So do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then ten. And then um, when and then next to one, put like a like a asterisk or something if it's if it's applicable to you. Does that make sense? So we're gonna do a little activity, and I just want you to sort of keep track for yourself. Um, and for us to talk about. Okay, I'm gonna ask 10 questions and in the chat, you're gonna write one through 10 and then put an asterisk or the letter Y for yes next to the ones that apply um, from the list I'm going to read to you. Okay, ready? Is or has, do you, do you know anyone who is or has been in debt, medical, schooling, housing, or for a vehicle? So do you or anyone you know, okay. And then do you know someone who has faced or faces a life-threatening illness, who has faced or faces a life-threatening illness? Do you know someone who relies on daily medication? Do you know someone who has an addiction to substances or behaviors? Do you know someone who lives with pain, emotional, physical, or relational pain that compromises their vitality? Do you know someone who has stayed in a relationship, job, city, state, or country for insurance or debt? Do you know someone who has been evicted? Do you know someone who feels unsafe where they live? Do you know someone who doesn't have access to dignified education, housing, food, or opportunities? And do you know someone who has put aside their dreams and desires because of any of the aforementioned?
Okay, and then let's just look at the chat and see what we're looking at here. Yeah. So yeah, lots of yeses to this. So there were 10 statements and several of you were able to say yes to, to all of them. I don't know. Um, so let's take a moment and notice where this lands with us. Where in our bodies do we feel this? And we're not accustomed to intentionally feeling. Um, we're used to metabolizing things with our minds rather than just sitting with our feelings. And I just want us to take a moment to, to just feel. Where does this reside in your body? I personally feel this in my, uh, my jaw and I feel it kind of in my throat, just thinking about those things. Anybody else wanna share? I guess I'd have to say in my, in my mind, in my head, in my brain, not, not in any muscles anywhere. <laughs> in my stomach yeah my shoulders yeah oh, yeah i feel that in my shoulders too yeah i asked this question um well let's go ahead um will you go to slide seven jerry and then let's screen share again thank you for taking a moment to do that exercise back yeah definitely i feel it yeah so uh, the next one, and then the one after that, it's the one without hands on it. Someday when I do a presentation, I will figure out how to screen share and do the presentation at the same time. <laughs> that day is on the horizon for me. I almost had it today. I was so excited. So I apologize for this awkwardness. So I appreciate your patience too. It goes back to, I think, a little bit of what Harry was refer referring to. How are we with one another? So Is this one, where you want to be? One more. Yeah. So at least you think that what that little survey I, we just did was unique to just our little group. I wanted to share some stats with you. And again, as you read through them for yourselves, just take a moment to... Do a body scan and see where this sits with you, where it lands. 66% of adults are on prescription drugs. 43.4 inadequately insured. 80% are in debt. 13.4 live below the poverty line. 12% have inadequate food. 70% only feel safe at home. 30 million U.S. citizens live in inadequate housing. 46% have family member, have a family member with an addiction issue. 45 have a family member who's been incarcerated. And 61% of us are lonely. That's an incredible amount of pain. Yeah, it is an incredible amount of pain. Um, yeah. And I bring this up um, because when I think about sustainability initiatives, well, all of that is pain in the body. Yeah, this affects my core too, yeah. This is pain that is ex felt and experienced and endured and suffered in the body, in our bodies and in the bodies of others and in communal bodies. And so, when we think about sustainability initiatives, I wonder whose bodies or what bodies our initiatives serve. And I ask these questions because the, the manufactured systems that cause these, this level of suffering um, that we're creating solutions for, are they supporting or are they harming bodies? 
And on the whole, I wonder if they harm our individual bodies, our relational and communal bodies, and do they distance us from our earthly body, which allows us to cause our earthly body then harm. That was a lot to take in, so we can just sit here for a second. And if you have questions or comments, uh, please share. So I'm gonna depress you just a minute further, and then we're gonna turn, I promise. We're not gonna stay in this sort of um, space. So if you'll go to the next slide. Um, this is sort of uh, some stats that I gathered, sort of looking at the sustainability movement trajectory over the last, um, I, I think I took a decade to kind of look at this, like where was it at 2011 and where was it, where, what are the stats at 2021? to kind of look and see like what kind of progress are we making um, towards um, sustainability goals. The number of report, reported environmental defenders murdered continues to rise in 2011, it was 130 and in 20, oh, 2020, sorry, I missed, I meant to do 2021, it's 227. Um, Earth overshoot day comes earlier each year. 2011, it was August 3rd. Um, 2020 was August 22nd. That's right, I did it to, for 2020. I did, yeah. Okay, plastic pollution production continues to increase. Um, 2011, we had 211 metric tons, and in 2020, we produced 367 metric tons, despite all our recycling. Um, CO2 parts per million in 2011 was 390. And in 2020, it was 4, 12.5. 50% of products on shelves contain palm oil. And e waste in 2021 was 41.5 million tons to 58 million tons in 2020. Um, and I share those stats. They, they seem a little abstract to me when they're just numbers. And that's why I try to focus our conversation on embodiment because this is all experienced in the body, if not our own personal body, it's experienced in ecosystem bodies in cultural bodies, river and forest and animal and fish and bird bodies, in geographic bodies, in cultural bodies, in country bodies. And so how does it, this land in your body? Where does it land in your body? I appreciate uh, Tim's point. He says, is there a difference between um, our bodies and earthly bodies? Yeah, that's, that's kind of at the heart of things, isn't it? Is there a difference? And, and again, I think the question for me is, do sustainability initiatives account for the body? And maybe it doesn't because based on the stats, um, we just looked about uh, the state of the union, the state of society, and where we, you, you answered yes to some questions, maybe we don't account for, sustain, for bodies within sustainability movement because our society doesn't honor our embodiment either. Just, so next slide, please. Since we're such a small group, feel free to comment or ask questions at any point. We can, this is more of a conversation, right? Since it's just us um, rather than a presentation. So the next uh, one, can you go to the next one? Thank you. So what if we started thinking about, if we started thinking about sustainability as it, uh, um, that sustainability is meant to nourish, um, in the words of Mary Oliver, the soft animal of our body. What if sustainability was meant to nourish 
the soft animal body in general. And what if we start with the premise that sustainability means we become bodily, ecologically, spiritually, and communally literate? What if we start there? What if sustainability means we create ecosystems of care, which I think is what you were getting at, Harry, when you spoke earlier. Tom says, if we treated our homes like we treat the earth, we would all be living in places with no windows or doors. Everything would be rotting and decaying. Oh yeah, yeah. Like if we weren't being, uh, if we weren't tending and caring, yeah. Okay, next slide. So, um, wait, don't, not yet. No, no, that's fine. You can be there. <laughs> that's fine. Um, so by way of, this is what I talked about in the first um, part of this. So if you missed it, that's terrific because you're going to get to hear it now. So I'll clarify what I mean by ecosystems of care by sharing what I don't mean. And I'll use an analogy. So this is a house plant. It provides benefits to the homeowners because it purifies the air. It's aesthetically pleasing and it provides a bit of humidity. Okay, right? House plant. Next slide. So this pothos exists in isolation in a pot. It requires water, sunlight, and some temperature control in specific ongoing ways. So it also needs someone to tend the leaves when they will, to train the leaves when they trail. And the only species it serves is the human who owns it. But most significantly, significantly, it needs external inputs to survive. It's a siloed species that requires unnatural maintenance. It does not provide or receive ecosystem benefits, nor does it have full expression. And I think about this in terms of um, the idea in that individual efforts will turn into collective good. That's a common uh, belief in the sustainability movement. Um, but, but I submit for your consideration that what we've been doing is engaging in siloed efforts, not individual efforts. And I'll explain in the next slide. So here's an example of an individual species, a dandelion in a natural habitat, habitat, my yard. What does she do there? She <laughs> prevents soil erosion. She breaks up clay because of her deep taproot, which also means she infiltrates water and helps us with runoff. She makes calcium available for other plants. She increases soil mineral content for other plants. She supports pollinators. She increases biodiversity, not to mention the countless health benefits she has um, for those who consume her, consume her, like me and other mammals. Like she is so good for us and she's good for where she is too. So she has all these benefits. She's an individual species within an ecosystem that provide, so she provides and receives benefits and she is naturally regenerating there. So next slide. Oh wait, I'm sorry, go back one more. So this is what, go back, go back, go back. This is like a dance, go back there, go back. No, no, one more. <laughs> go back to the dandelions. <laughs> there should be two dandelion pictures, but they're not, okay. So, Nope, they're not, okay. That's okay, you can stay right there, thank you. It just feels like we're dancing, Jerry, doesn't it? Like this is some sort of dance move. You take four, you go forward one step and then you go back two steps. Okay, um, so this is what individual effort creating collective good looks like. And to underscore the bodily connection, all the benefits I mentioned of this individual in the species, in an ecosystem, impacts bodies, earthly bodies, pollinator bodies, other plant bodies, mammal bodies, even our water body. 
And then of course, it's in the dandelion's best interest to be in, an, in its naturally occurring ecosystem. So now we're gonna go one up. Next one, there, okay. So like I, I'm bringing this up again because siloed species require unnatural maintenance, do not provide or receive ecosystem benefits and do not have full expression. And I'm so, showing this to you again to make an analogy. How much of what I've listed on the slide is applicable to us humans based on the exercise we did moments ago? And that's just something to consider. Like, do we have these, do we exist in these systems that hamper us? And then are we engaging in sustainability initiatives to maintain the systems that are hampering us from our full expression? What does full expression mean? Uh, what do you want it to mean? It can mean whatever you want it to mean. It's up to you to decide that. Meaning in what way, so living with full vitality um, living in a, a life full of pleasure, living a life that is full of choice. Um, relatively, I mean, as much as possible, pain-free in your relationships, um, fear-free, um, joy-filled, purposeful life. Does that answer? Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. I love it when people ask questions. Um, okay, next slide. So I ask, I bring this up to say, um, can we have an ecosystem approach to our sustainability solutions. And the ecosystems approach not only to our own lives, but to sustainability initiatives will help us determine whether our solutions are worthwhile. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna um, look into the chat and see what's being talked about after I read through this slide. So sustainability solutions, do they facilitate regenerative relationships like a dandelion in its ecosystem? Do they support personal and communal transformation, liberation, and well being? Do they encourage embodied vitality, full expression of self and others? Do they foster an earth centric or ecological literacy? And do they honor seasons of abundance and fallowness where needs are met without creating other needs? Like a houseplant creates a set of needs that you constantly have to keep addressing. So this, uh, Harry, this also kind of gets to what I mean by, uh, as, in response to your question of what does full expression mean? Tom says being connected, oh, what does full expression being connected to the earth in touch with nature and what sustains us? I also think full expression too in our own lives, like are we cultivating, are we able to pursue what we believe we were put on this earth to do? Are we, uh, are we allowed and able to uh, pursue our passions? We, those two things are connected. The personal, our personal sustainability in our own lives and then the sustainability that we're trying to create in the world. Um, and, and then you can go to the next slide. And in the words of... Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to kind of borrow from Robin Wall Kimmerer, um, is the solution mutualistic, reciprocal, and regenerative? And if it's not, then it's kind of a houseplant. Um, uh, let me give you an example. If I send my glass, my trash, my recycling, and my compost away, 
that's seen as an individual action, but it's actually a siloed action because I have zero idea of the impact of my action on the collective. It keeps me siloed. It keeps all those functions. Um, it keeps me ignorant of all those functions, all the, all the impacts of my choices. By contrast, perhaps an individual impacting the collective would be me starting a compost pile in my backyard that all my neighbors can use. So we all put our um, food scraps, yard waste in that compost, and then we share exactly, there is no away, right? And, and, I'm, and then, then we all share the soil from that compost. So we're creating community and we have, and we are seeing exactly where our soil is coming from. We're seeing exactly where our um, organic waste matter is going. And we're participating in a naturally occurring system that, that we learned from ecosystems, right? From naturally, natural ecosystems. And, and Joe, to your point, I wonder too, like there is no way and, and based on research, recycling, the volume of recycling, I mean, we're glutting the, what's the word I want to say? Like there's so much recycling matter, but we're still using um, new resources to create the things that we're recycling. So we're not closing that loop very well, if at all. I mean, we know that plastics is not being recycled. So this idea of a way as part of the solution is not a solution. What do you say? Do several sorts of communal suffering, did the several sorts of suffering also generate helpful sympathy that may be fertile ground for, yes. I absolutely hope so, yes. That may be, yes, yeah. And, and I think too, we, that's why I wanna focus on the body because that suffering, maybe that will allow us to recognize to, that's another lens to look at the choices and the actions and the solutions we come up with. What is their role in the suffering or the ease that other species will experience? Yeah. Okay, next slide. Joe says, we need to demand products and purchased items from recycled. Yeah, I mean, for sure. It definitely feels like the, the consumer is the one who has been made to carry the weight of this when it's really industry practices and manufacturing practices um, that need to be held accountable. I always think of it a bit like blaming the victim. Um, so, I, I, I'm looking at this picture as the siloed solutions, name one of them, like, and since Joe, you mentioned um, recycled goods just now, I'm thinking about that in, in terms of this, like recycling is one of those siloed things that we do. Um, similar to these plants, not being an actual ecosystem and, and they're sort of siloed in their pots. So it's like a bunch of asynchronous houseplants aggregated to create an ecosystem, but um, it's really not. So siloed solutions coexisting are not sustainable because they don't make an ecosystem, they don't serve ecosystems, they don't serve bodies, they're not relationship, and they do, they do not increase our ecological literacy. We can remain illiterate and ignorant and yet engage in them, in these, in some sustainable solutions. Do you want an example of what I'm talking about? I mean, or I can't tell if this is abstract or you need it. I can provide a concrete example of what I mean. So um, I think this photo is a great example. 
Well, I meant in, thank you. I meant in terms of like a sustainable initiative that does not meet, it does not serve ecosystems. It doesn't necessarily support the well being of bodies, does not create relationship, does not increase ecological literacy. So um, I have um, an electric vehicle. Um, I bought a 2015 um, Leaf, which is great when during fair weather, but in the winter when it's really cold, the mileage just drops way down. And I think it's because of the year, uh, the 2015. And because it lives outside, it doesn't have a garage. Um, it sometimes takes a battery a really long time to charge through a trickle charge. Um, and, and I think about like the car, the shell of the car, is, is just fine. And once upon a time, um, there was talk about allowing people just to replace the battery. So I could replace the battery with a brand, you know, with a, a newer one, but they don't let you do that anymore. So if I wanted to keep driving in, in an EV, I mean, I can keep kind of limping along with this one. It's, it's fine. Um, or I'd have to like buy a whole new one, but I don't need an actual physical car. I just need a battery. However, what's gonna happen to my old battery? Where's it gonna go? The infrastructure for recycling those things aren't there. And it's definitely not compostable. So it is going to end up polluting somewhere, some, some the bodies of some other beings. And, all the materials, like we, th I, I pick on EVs because we don't recognize that if I'm buying something new, there's still this long list of extractive practices that relied on fossil fuels to produce this thing. And my point of contact, my, my little point of contact in, with it might be virtuous, but how does that fit into the big thing, into the big picture? Does that make sense? Like I, I haven't, it hasn't changed my relationship necessarily with the earth. I has, it doesn't increase my ecological literacy. It doesn't serve, EVs only serve one species and not everybody of this species, human species. It just serves a small, a small bit of us. It doesn't create, it doesn't provide ecosystem services for anybody. And so again, I think about, okay, we've built this system, this world that runs in a, on these things. And yet if we are suffering bodily within these systems, then let's think about whether these systems need to continue to exist. It's definitely a band-aid. it's not a solution. And when we say, well, it's, and when we are able to settle for band-aids, what does that mean that we're settling for something that perpetuates harm elsewhere? What is the level of harm that we find acceptable? And why is that so? Is that because we're accustomed to harm? Those are just questions to think about. Um, okay, next slide. What is, so, oh no, go back one more. I have two slides that look similar. Keep going. It's going to be the plant one. Yeah, right. If you'll go just one more forward, we'll be there. There. Ah. <laughs> this is so funny. Okay, go back one. There are two that look exactly the same. They just have different words on the bottom. So go back one. Okay. What is the cost to ourselves of surviving siloed and manufactured ecosystems? And that's just kind of like, I guess I, I just bring this up to say we've created, you know, Tom, I think said in the chat that these are Band-Aid solutions. And I think about that. Um, we, there's... There's a capitalist formula around extraction, consumption, disposal. And we can't green that up because it defies nature. It defies gravity. It defies the wisdom and efficiency of natural systems. Because in natural systems, 
there's going to be extraction, consumption, and disposal, but they function in specific, limited, directed, seasonal, efficient, purposeful, regenerative ways. There's no externalized costs or waste in naturally occurring ecosystems. Everything serves a purpose, even poop. And so what's the cost of siloed solutions? What is the cost for us to survive in these siloed manufactured ecosystems? Oh, what does Tom say? If we don't, it's a, if we don't see it personally, it doesn't exist. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and so like here, it feels like we, um, we understand we can engage in siloed ways because we've siloed ourselves. Um, we, are in, we are cut off from our inherent ecosystems nature. Um, that's why we're able to offshore or turn a blind eye to, to the parts of our engagement that don't affect us. And so we're asked here, what's the, what is the next iteration of how we organize ourselves as human beings on this planet. What's the next thing we're creating? Because this model doesn't honor our fullest expression, our interdependence and our spiritual core. So the next slide. Yeah, Harry says, this is an unduly segregated. Oh, wait, your comment went away. Oh, there it is. Unduly segregated, un, un, unidimensional experience. Yeah, and, and we're built and wired for so much more than that. So I bring this up again um, because definitely like the next iteration, when we talk about sustainability in terms of like um, how our relationship with the planet, we have to think about this too the current model and the solutions we're trying to come up with for the current model don't honor our fullness or all our needs. So what is it exactly that we're trying to sustain? Um, and I bring this up because we know that the manufacturer systems that we exist in were built by and are maintained by separation by domination of ourselves and the other. It's built on exploitation of the body, individual bodies, cultural bodies, communal bodies, natural and earthly bodies. It's built on extraction, externalized cost and waste. And, and so like we can't pretty that up. Um, so this feels like it fits and I'm not exactly sure how it fits, but I wanted to bring it up in tonight's talk to sort of explore it with you. Um, wait, before I go on there, any comments, thoughts, responses? I feel like I'm throwing a lot at you. Um, do we need to like stretch and move around? Cause this was so much stuff. Like where, how are you, how is all this landing for you? Would you repeat that last statement again about how? the uh, characteristics of the uh, manufactured ecosystem? Yeah, sure. Um, manufactured ecosystems are built, were built by and maintained through separation and domination of the self and the other. They're built on exploitation of the body, individual bodies, cultural bodies, communal bodies, natural bodies, and earthly bodies. It's built on extraction and externalized cost and waste. And we as humans don't thrive in these systems and natural ecosystems don't work that way. And Mary, this is a new concept for me. The concept of siloed systems mm. really has is just a new idea for me, and it opens some the potential of some big doors in terms of of uh, looking for better solutions. Oh, I'm so glad! I'm so glad, Harry. That makes me happy. Um, I think I came to this 
idea just in a couple ways. One, doing my own internal work around um, how do I become a more authentic, integrated person and not silo off parts of myself that I um, consider um, unacceptable. So that's one part of it. And then also recognizing um, having worked in the environmental field and having uh, my three daughters, 19, almost 17 and 14. And, you know, they grew up with a mom who was militantly environmental. Um, you know, I was a person at parties who would be like scowling at other people because they were throwing, you know, you know, recyclables in the trash. And I would spend the whole evening digging recyclables out of the trash. And I was like that kind of person where we only shopped at thrift stores and I would not buy out of season fruit. Like just, I was a pain in the ass to live with. Um, um, and then, you know, they got to an age where they were just like, no. And they just kind of wholesale rejected this, this way of being because it was not, um, it wasn't fun. Like, <laughs> you know, and then they were going, they were in school where what I was seeing in the school environment was complete. Like it was a different world. Um, Joe, you just got back from Egypt, which is, you understand is a completely different reality and world and culture than the culture here. And so school culture is like consume, 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 dispose, 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 consume, consume, consume. And then the environmental, um, you know, community is like, let's turn off lights. Let's do this over here. You know, um, let's turn, you know, let's wear winter coats in the house so that we can cut on energy. And so it was like that to be in those two realities felt very siloed. And that's what got me thinking, like, this isn't an ecosystems approach. Like there, there's these disconnects and we cannot evolve if we are living in these siloed ways. So that that's where this thinking came of. And then also recognizing that my efforts at recycling don't matter if I'm not consuming, like Joe says, recycled product. If I'm not going to the store and buying things off the shelf that are made from recycled products, then why am I recycling? So that it could end up in another country? That's a siloed thing. So that it could end up in a warehouse waiting for somebody to do something with it? That doesn't make sense. I just started to see how all these things were not adding up to what we hope that they would add up to. So, and the thing with, you know, e EVs, I just, it's so problematic. Like there's, what is it doing geopolitically for us to be mining materials from other countries? Like we can't ignore all of those things. Okay. So this is what I, so that's kind of what led me down this, this idea of siloed. We are taking way more than we are giving, growing, sustaining. We have this way. Yeah. And we are fit. Yeah. And I think we fail to honor what it provides because we don't honor ourselves, you know, and that's, and that's why I did that little exercise with us in the beginning, because I attended this um, conference on pleasure as activism and the, and the facilitator said that the individual body is a fractal of the collective body. And I, I love that so much. Um, so when you think about like what we're doing to the earth as a reflection of what our systems are doing to us, we can see that. What are we um, offshoring in our lives? What are we uh, siloing? What, what are we doing? That, and then, and how is that manifest in our relationship with earth? How are we dishonoring ourselves in the systems that we exist in? And, and then of course it begs the question, are, these, are the prevailing systems worth saving? Just because we know them and we live within them doesn't mean that they're serving us. I, I think we also need to structure our experiences so that there are some wins. Mm -hmm. uh, that I think harnesses some of the suffering. Uh, yes, balances it in a way that's uh, uh, productive. So I, I think a, as we try to live our lives, we need also to regularly set up 
situations that we think will will uh, amount to a win, even though it doesn't seem terribly significant in the in the long run of things. Mm. But we do need wins. Yeah. Yes. And and I like that focus on wins because that allows us to reimagine what we mean by wins. Like to me, I've just recently discovered um, plants that are considered weeds as medicinal and edible. That feels like an enormous win to me that I can go outside and graze on violets and purple dead nettle and henbit and uh, dandelions. And I, and this, the delight in that has opened me up to exploring things that are brand new. And, and to me, when you say win, I definitely see that as connected to this, this idea of pleasure as activism. Um, we go to the next slide. So this, this to me connects to the whole wind thing. To thrive, we, our bodies need relational ecosystems because our winds can't exist siloed. They can't be in a vacuum, right? They happen within context. They happen within relationship. And, and what, what would that mean if we reclaim ourselves as part of ecosystems, not siloed? What would it mean for us as a species, as mammals, to reclaim our interdependence, as to reference an old um, musical group, if we, if we reclaim ourselves as village people, you know, as earthlings within an ecosystem? Because being siloed, as, as, um, as Harry pointed out, has that, that suffering that that all take has taken a toll on us. Okay, so let's next slide. Wow, time is flying. So I think about this um, again. I I think about this quote by Racima Menakem in relation to the work of sustainability. Um, Trauma in a person decontextualized over time looks like personality. Trauma in a family decontextualized over time looks like family traits. And trauma in a people decontextualized over time looks like culture. And I think about that as a way to, to reframe our understanding of the status quo of our culture. If we have lived in a culture that is traumatizing, then that gives us the freedom to recognize that we are not um, shackled to that culture. We do not have to continue living within it. We can construct something other that is more reflective of an honoring relationship with ourselves and our living earth. So what is the goal of sustainability to support and maintain a traumatizing culture? I think not. I think we are poised to do some revolutionary transformative work here, not to figure out how to keep the current systems going in green ways, but it's to transform, evolve, to liberate both ourselves and the other. And by other, I mean that like with my arms open wide to include all species. So let's do a little exercise together now. Um, so much to, oh wait, let's, let's pause here. We need to live in community where walk or public transportation was the norm. Um, EV has its problems in, in construction, but over a lifetime, much less to community. What do you mean by that, Joe? I miss, I'm missing something here. Oh, everything has its problems. You're not saying EV, right? Are you there? Yeah, I definitely think, so when I think about solutions, I definitely think of hyper-local solutions within walking distance, within biking distance. Like, what am I creating with the people on my block? Am I going to grow the zucchini this year, and the woman next door is going to grow the corn, and the person across the street is going to grow the tomatoes, and the person across the street is going to grow let's see, the potatoes, and then we're gonna rotate and we're gonna share and we're gonna can together. That would be a dream for me. Are we all gonna go into buying a large vehicle that we can share for the times that some of us need a large vehicle 
And then can we just like, how can we reimagine community so we create create not only ecosystems where where we are and the structures we have now, but then how can we think beyond that? And and we can't get to the beyond that if we are terrified. So part of the 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 conversation in the environmental world is the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and that sort of thinking true as it might be, hampers our ability to think. So I want you to do a little exercise with me. Um, take a hand and make a fist, make a really hard fist. Just make your hand, your fist as hard as you possibly can. You got your fist? Are your fingernails digging into your hand somehow? Okay, now take your other hand and then try to pry it open. Try to just try to pull your fist apart and see how far you get. You feel the resistance? Okay, now take that hand that was pulling it apart and just set your fist in it. And just breathe for a minute. And what do you notice happening to your fist? Especially as you breathe. And notice where else in your body you might be clenched. The revolution begins when we are gentle and create space for ourselves. That's where true sustainability will come from. Okay, next slide. So what do we need sustainability? What do we need in sustainability? I can't read my own, my own slide. What do we need in sustainability to facilitate regenerative relationship? Support personal and communal transformation, liberation, and well-being. To encourage embodied vitality, full expression of self and, the, and other beings. To foster earth centricity or ecological literacy. Honor seasons of abundance and fallowness and meet needs without creating other needs. So let's create ecosystems of mutualism, reciprocity, and regeneration. And again, those, that, that phrase mutualism, reciprocity, and regeneration is from Robin Wall Kimmerer. And I wanna say something here about abundance. In the constructed and manufactured world, we expect 24-7, 365 abundance and availability. But we are actually wired bodily for Earth's abundance because it is based on cycles of rest, regeneration, and periods of fallowness and rhythms and moon cycles. Earth is abundant always, because she is cyclical. We are killing ourselves because we are trying to deny those natural rhythms. And without those cycles, we are actually in a constant state of scarcity, which causes us to want 24 seven, 365 availability. Comments, reflections, thoughts, feelings? Where in your body is this landing for you? Or not. It's a lot to take in, huh? Okay, so the next slide, Jerry, looks just like this slide, only with a minor change. Maybe not. Okay, so let's come up with solutions that compel us to be ecologically spiritually, communally, and bodily 
literate in the abundance that earth offers, rather than to keep ourselves in an ignorant consumer position. Let's come up with solutions that help us evolve and honor our full identity, where we are allowed to change our orientation to earth, our, de our definition of ourselves within an ecosystem. And I believe, I mean, we wouldn't be at a meeting for the Sustainable Sanctuary Coalition if we did not have a spiritual component to our understanding of sustainability. And I believe we are called to a full embodiment and a deeper relationship with ourselves, each other, and earth that has to do with spirit and, our, and communion with the divine. That's both internal and external work. And we won't get there if we're just focused on policy, laws, and external behaviors. Because external fixes won't address our whole selves. And they don't get to the complexities of who we are. Um, and, and just sort of, we, I guess another piece of this is, is to recognize we can't go beyond our bodies or the bodies of others or our earthly body. So can we use science and technology to honor the sacredness of that and not try to defy it instead? I feel like we've been trying to use science and tech to defy sort of our natural boundaries and our natural um, rhythms, which causes us to be disconnected in some ways from ourselves and from our and our belonging to earth. We need to live in, yeah, okay, a start is to recognize our own need for rest, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. We're so out of touch with that sense of rhythm. I mean, I, I understand that, and, you know, that causes us to kind of be deer in headlights a little bit, and so we can't if we're not resting and regenerating and refueling, then where will our imagination come from to imagine a different reality than this reality? And then lastly, oh, will you go to the next slide, Jerry? So this again, I attended this Pleasure as Activism conference that has me all fired up to learn more about pleasure as activism. And the facilitator said this that I love so much, pleasure and trauma healing is the revolution the world needs. And, and I think about um, your term wins, Harry, when I think about pleasure. Like I, I've kind of spent um, time talking about the trauma part with you. Um, and a little bit in my own journey. I'm, I, so I'm just so jazzed by this idea that there is activism that is based on pleasure. Um, so yeah, like I said, there's so much of the environmental movement that, that feels like it's based on doom and gloom. And so I wanted to, to share, oh, or, and, and I was definitely this when my kids were little in terms of like being very militant. And, and this quote came up in our um, Pleasure is Activism conference, and I was just so delighted by it. I wanted to share it with you. Um, I can only accept and pleasure myself into more healing, and I cannot shame myself into healing. And, I, and I, that struck me as true for our relationship with Earth, too. We can only move into a deeper relationship, a deeper understanding of ourselves as part of ecosystems through pleasure, through delight, through discovery, through joy. It cannot be based on shame or a should. I mean, it, so, and then the other thing that I was just so struck by, which was such a different way of thinking for me was that um, pleasure is a birthright. And when I, when you think about how I started this talking about embodiment, I think about how we deny ourselves pleasure for capitalism, for systems, or we let the systems tell us what kind of pleasure is allowed to us and when. But to have joy, for example, in Purple Dead Nettle, 
that's free and that's abundant. To have pleasure in like what Tom mentioned earlier about, I think he said his window was open and there was a breeze coming in and, uh, or to appreciate the moon and the stars and the sunset and the birds singing, just to allow ourselves to just be in those spaces with the natural world. Um, that joyful relationship um, opens up our capacity to see that this time is not just a time of calamity, but it is also a time of opportunity. Our human systems should be structured to support our pleasure, our aliveness, our awakening, our gratitude, our humility, and our joy, and our celebration, our aliveness. Um, so yeah, so I think I, that's just kind of where I want to leave you, um, or it leaves time for more and for questions and and reflections and yeah, I'll stop there. Oh, I actually I do want to say one more thing. Um, what does sustainability look like? What does a sustainable society look like when our when our vision for a sustainable society emanates from an ecosystem's paradigm rooted in embodied pleasure? And I say embodied because what we do impacts bodies, our own bodies, the bodies of other beings, and our earthly body. And so if we're not moving into the conversation around sustainability, with this um, paradigm of pleasure, then, then what's then kind of what's the point? There's got to be joy in it. And if we're not intentional about pleasure, do we create space that that allows for harm? And so far, it seems like since we're not allowing for pleasure or not having that be an intention, there's so much harm that's being done. Thoughts? Yeah. Pleasure in the simple joy of nature. That is what sustains us. That is everything. That is life. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, we've got like nine minutes left. Um, do, and we can talk about any of this. We can go back to former slides. You can give me some reflections. I, I've got a little assignment for you because I used to be a teacher, so I love giving homework. I have a question. Mm. Uh, we've recorded this, I think, and with the intent of sharing it, is there a way that we can take your slides and save them as a pdf file and send them out with the recording yeah i can do that uh, i'm not i'm not familiar with this type of um this software i'm familiar with powerpoint but not what you're using now is there a way to save that as a pdf each slide separately as a page yep i did and, and i will send that to you yeah yeah and then we can send those out um with the recording okay yep i can do that um, so the assignment that I wanted to give you all is to take 10 minutes and be outside, just maybe if you can, if you're comfortable, I, I would really encourage you to be barefoot, find a spot where you can be barefoot. Um, it's a gratitude practice that I started uh, actually before the winter where I would just stand outside next to my garden beds barefoot and consider and meditate on my, um, my place in this particular longitude and latitude that I find myself. And I try to just sort of experience where I am bodily what am i hearing what am i feeling um what is around me who is around me and i try to imagine the 
various species underfoot and all around me. And I also try to like cultivate some quiet so that I can hear other voices besides my own human voice in my head um, and just express gratitude. And to recognize too, that as I stand there as an Egyptian person, as whatever you are, that in your indigenous ancestry, there is a deeper connection to ecosystems that you can bring to bear to this conversation about sustainability. There's wisdom in your DNA here that we need. And enjoy yourself when you're there, just standing there, just taking 10 minutes to just be in that space, communing with your particular ecosystem, your particular here and now in your body. So thank you.